A reading from Exodus. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And it will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariot and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, all the Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down at the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. 
the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The word of the Lord. Amen. Well, friends, it is a delight to be with you this morning. I feel really honored uh, to have the opportunity to be here um, preaching this morning, celebrating in Father Aaron's stead. Um, he really blessed Cornerstone when he was visiting us a couple weeks ago, so I hope to return the favor in some way uh, by blessing you all by my presence and my family's presence here this morning. And uh, to that end also, Cornerstone sends our greetings. We love you guys a lot. And we're really grateful to be connected um, with you in our di- diocesan family. So I'm just really excited uh, for this morning together. Um, let me begin by just making an initial observation. Um, there are some events that are so momentous that they really never stop shaping us. You know what I mean? Um, maybe just a small example. If you think of, well, kind of a big example. If you think of our own country, uh, July 4th, 1776 was a pretty pivotal moment in the life of our nation. On that day, the Declaration of Independence was signed. And on that day, it functionally began our nation, or at least the idea of it, as, as we declared, the colonies declared independence from Great Britain. So it's this critical event, right? We teach it to our children in schools. Uh, some of you may have um, been born abroad but became U.S. citizens, and on the naturalization exam, you had to know about the Declaration of Independence for that exam. And the ideas that are kind of baked into um, that date, that moment, have continued to shape us ever since, especially the ideas of things like liberty and freedom in our country. And so uh, many, many years later, someone like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his I Have a Dream speech, one of the most iconic speeches ever, at the climax of that speech, he would appeal to the Declaration of Independence by saying he longs for this nation to rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal right? That date, that moment, has had a profound effect on the future of shaping who we are as a people. So similarly, the crossing of the Red Sea in the book of Exodus is one of those momentous events that never stops shaping us as God's people. It, at the time, was what functionally began the nation of Israel, right? On one side of the sea, they were under Egyptian rule. On the other side of the of the thing, they were fully and finally free. And in the Old Testament and New Testament, God's people refer back to this moment over and over again. We heard it in our psalm reading this morning. It was alluded to in our psalm today. And this is the only text that's actually required every single year at the Easter Vigil to be read because it is so, so crucial for understanding God's saving work on our behalf. It will forever shape us as God's people with the idea that God acts with power to free his people from their bondage. That's the God we've come to know. And so it's central to who God is. He is a God who brings freedom to his people, to you, to me. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about a God who brings freedom to us, that's a compelling idea. Because the idea of freedom is compelling to us, isn't it? I think all of us have this inner awareness that we need freedom for our own flourishing. It's part of what it means to be fully alive. And so this passage makes me want to lean in a little bit and get to know this God. Because a God who brings freedom is a God worth knowing. Now, as we dive into this passage, I want to say to you this morning that this scene, this episode, paints a specific vision of freedom, I think, and a specific template for God's saving deeds. And I would summarize it like this. God doesn't save his people simply to set them free, but to make them his. God sets us free to make us his. The Bible teaches that belonging to God is what ultimately makes us free. And so I recognize this morning we had a very long passage. It's actually what was a sign for the Easter Vigil. Don't get mad at me. It's what the Easter Vigil was signed. Um, It's a long passage, so we're not going to be able to go kind of two verse by verse in depth. But what I want to do is I want to suggest to you there are kind of three claims that this text is organized around that have to do with freedom, the biblical idea of freedom. And I want to unpack each of those for a few moments together with you this morning. So here's the first claim. We are set free 
as we trust the one who fights for us. We're set free when we trust the one who fights for us. Our passage, Exodus 14, is the climax of a conflict conflict that's been going on throughout the book of Exodus. And the conflict centers around this. To whom does Israel belong? Do they belong to Pharaoh? Or do they belong to the Lord, the God of Israel? And so throughout Exodus thus far, the Lord has been already fighting for his people to win them from their slavery in Egypt. He inflicted 10 plagues upon the Egyptians. And after that, Pharaoh released the people, right? And now they're on their journey away from Egypt. And just before our passage today, if you had just the beginning part of Exodus 14, you would learn two surprising pieces of information for the Israelites at this moment where we find them in Exodus 14. In verse 5, the first thing we learn is that Pharaoh regrets letting Israel go because he wants his slaves back. The first detail we find. And the second detail in verses 3 through 4 that we find is that the Lord has been intentionally leading Israel up against the Red Sea. And so the Pharaoh, who wants his slaves back, is going to see them trapped against the Red Sea and think that they have no escape route from him. What the Lord's doing, it seems here, is he's actually baiting Pharaoh into pursuing Israel at the Red Sea. Why would he do that? Well, Moses summarizes the Lord's intention in verse 14 of our passage. The Lord will fight for you. He's setting all this up so that he and he alone can fight for the Israels. He is going to win the battle that the Israelites cannot win for themselves. He's going to prove his intentions with Israel at this moment. Let me ask you a question this morning. Has someone ever fought for you in your life? Maybe, maybe you were in a moment of need or crisis and someone stepped up and they fought for you. They fought a battle that you couldn't fight for yourself. Maybe it was a spouse or a friend, a relative. In my own life, I actually have a pretty critical story of this. It's also somewhat personal. I know we don't know each other very well, so forgive me. Um, but when I was born, I was eight weeks premature. Now, I was born in the 1980s, which wasn't the Stone Age, but there were some interventions that weren't around then, right? And so I had a number of health complications being born that early that required a lot of care. And my parents, my parents fought for me when I was a baby. They endured many, many sleepless nights on my behalf. They covered medical costs that I don't even know the full extent of at this point still. They watched me undergo painful, complicated procedures I still have the scars on my body from them. But when I was a baby, my parents fought for me. And the reason I'm standing before you today is because my parents fought for me. I'm a lie because they fought for me. Now Israel's testimony, I want to suggest to you at the Red Sea, is that they were alive because the Lord fought for them. It's a very familiar event to many of us. We know the story of the Red Sea, right? But it is also, if we just take a step back and look at it afresh, maybe, it's a stunning event as well, isn't it? I mean, think about this moment for them. That through Israel's leader, Moses, the Lord would make a path through the sea, the seemingly inescapable route. He would make a way for them through the sea by gathering the waters to the right and to the left of them. And in my mind's eye, I kind of imagine walking through like the shed aquarium, you know? And so there's like, walls of water on both sides and you can see like a shark here or whatever. I'm, there probably aren't sharks in the Red Sea, but you get the idea. And the difference though being that there's a lot more adrenaline for the Israelites than for, you know, us in the Shed Aquarium, unless you're followed by that army of kindergartners in the Shed Aquarium. You can get a little intense, but, but uh, no, that's kind of how I envision this. It's a miracle. It is an incredible miracle. But God doesn't just stop there, does he? He also, the scripture says, throws the Egyptians into a panic, specifically, in verse 25, we learn, by clogging the Egyptian chariot wheels. That's a, that's a small detail, but it signifies something. See, the chariots for the Egyptians were their symbol of power. That was what made them a powerful military force, was their chariots. So for God to utterly stop those chariots was God saying, I'm in charge. Not the Pharaoh. 
not his forces. I'm in charge here. And in fact, God says that will be part of the effect of this whole episode is to prove that he is fully in charge in verses um, 17 and 18 of our passage. He tells Moses, I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. The Lord proves that he's the one in charge. And he also reveals who Israel truly belongs to. On the other side of the sea, Israel belongs fully and finally to God. They literally cross from oppression under Egypt to freedom in their true God. So at the Red Sea, the Lord reveals that he fights for his people to make them his. And this is a powerful revelation of the character of God. Because I, I want to suggest to you, nothing proves someone's love more, actually, than when they fight for you. I know my parents' love for me because of how they fought for me when I was a small child. And the effect of this revelation is that it builds your trust in the one who loves you. You understand their heart for you through the way they fight for you. That's what the Lord has done for his people here at the Red Sea, and I want to suggest for us as well. Which is why in verses 30 through 31, we see that Israel believed in the Lord when they saw his great power. They believed in him. He had fought for them so he could be trusted. Friends, there is perhaps no more foundational question for us this morning in our relationship to God than to get clear about this. Do I trust God? Really, truly, do I trust God? Because how I answer that question will make all the difference in how I orient my life. Do I trust in God? Do I trust in his goodness, believe in him? Let me leave that question there for a moment. Because there's a second claim about freedom in this text that's related to the first. It's this. We live in freedom as we serve our only worthy master. We live in freedom as we serve our only worthy master. In our passage, there's actually a second conflict, I think, that's related to the first. So the first was, who does Israel belong to? The second question is, who will Israel serve? Egypt, or the Lord? It's a question that's ultimately rooted in their trust. They will choose to serve the master that they ultimately trust. Now, this word service um, in the Hebrew comes from the word avad. And it's this rich word that has a couple of different shades of meaning. So it's not simply to serve. It can also mean to work in a general sense. It also can mean to serve in the sense we might use here, in a congregational setting, it's the service of worship, right? It's the the work that we render to God, right, is our worship. So it's this kind of multifaceted word. But what I want to say is that avad, ultimately, serving is a total life orientation. What you surrender yourself to, that is what you are serving. And in chapter four of the book of Exodus, we learn that the purpose of the Exodus is so that Pharaoh will let the Israelites go so they can serve the Lord rather than Pharaoh. God tells them up front, this is what's going to happen. Here's the plan. But in verses 10 through 14 of our passage, we see that Israel isn't quite so sure about that plan. Because in that moment, at the beginning of our passage, remember, they are trapped between the Egyptians that way and the Red Sea that way and they don't see the way out. And it causes them to question. They approach Moses and they start complaining, which becomes a theme for them throughout their history in the early days. They would have been better off staying in Egypt, they say, and serving the Pharaoh. They would have been better off than this. Before they'd seen God fight for them, they lack trust in the Lord, and they don't understand his intentions with them. And it causes them to distrust. But notice that the dynamic here is not whether 
Israel will serve someone. It is who will Israel serve? Which master will they serve? Uh, The Hebrew scholar John Levinson from Harvard Divinity School summarizes it really well, I think. He says this, the point of the Exodus is not freedom in the sense of self-determination, kind of a modern ideal. We get to determine who we are, not self-determination, but of service. The service of the loving, redeeming, and delivering God of Israel rather than the state and its proud king. That's the point of the Exodus. And so where we find Israel at the beginning of our passage is that they lack trust in the Lord and they are tempted to return to their former master, Pharaoh. Now, I want to suggest to you that I think the same dynamic is true for us today. It's not a question for us of whether we will serve another, but of which master will we serve? There's a 20th century theologian named Paul Tillich who I think has really helpful language um, helping, helps us think about this idea a little bit further. He says your ultimate concern in your life is functionally your master, your God, if you will. It's the thing that the rest of your life is organized around and surrendered to. It's what's in first place in your life, your ultimate concern. And for us as humans, we all have temptations to become enslaved to lesser things, to lesser masters. Why is that? Well, because we can become like the Israelites at the Red Sea. We can be tempted to place our trust in the comfort, control, pleasure, or just the sort of the known, (laughs) the known of those other masters. Those things seem to promise us instead of trusting God himself. So, for example, for some of us, um, it's possible that an ultimate concern in our life might become money, for example, the pursuit of money. And part of what that might fuel in us is a desire for security that we seek in financial health, right? It's one way it could play out. Another way it could play out is through our career, that we find our meaning and purpose solely in our pursuit of a career. And frankly, guys, I'll just speak personally, Even in the work of ministry, that can be a temptation, that I will over-identify myself with the work I'm doing for God's church rather than focusing strictly on my master, Jesus. It's a temptation. Maybe for you, there's a kind of, um, uh, you seek the pleasure or control or safety of even an addiction can, can, can sort of meet a need that we have for those things, right? Any of these kinds of things and more can become an ultimate concern in our lives, the thing we organize everything around. But here's what I want to say. Any concern other than the one true God will ultimately enslave you. It will ultimately enslave you. It isn't interested in your well-being like the God that we know is. It's not interested in your well-being, but meeting its impossible demands, whatever that might be. So if you're pursuing money, you'll feel like you never have enough. If you're pursuing success, you'll never be successful enough. If you find your meaning and your, your looks, your beauty, whatever, you'll never be beautiful enough. They're vicious taskmasters. Pharaoh could have cared less about Egypt, I'm sorry, Israel's well-being. Could have cared less about Israel's well-being. Only the Lord treats his people with steadfast love and faithfulness. And so friends, the good news for us today is that God wants to set us free from other destructive masters so that we can know true flourishing in him. And I recognize this is always an ongoing process. Even for Israel, after they had escaped from Egypt in the book of Deuteronomy, God's giving them commands. And as the basis of some of his commands, he says, you were once slaves in Egypt. So don't act like that anymore. When you were slaves, you acted in certain ways. Don't act like that anymore. But they still struggle throughout their history to get with the program, right, to some degree, because it takes a while to get Egypt out of your system. So this morning, what I want to offer to you with respect to this idea is a diagnostic question that I'd love for all of us to consider. What is my ultimate concern? What is taking first place in my life? And if you want a little help kind of getting the juices flowing and reflecting honestly about that, here's an exercise you can do. Imagine giving a perfect stranger three things from your personal life. One of them is all your recent receipts. 
The second one is your schedule. The third one is all your recent online activity. If I give a stranger those three things in my life, they'd probably get a pretty good idea of what might be competing for God as first place in my life. What is my ultimate concern? So think about that before the Lord. I I invite you to do that. There's an invitation for us to ask God to help us put him in first place in our lives this morning, I think. Because we trust that we can live in true freedom only if he is our one worthy master. At the end of our passage, we find in verse 31 that Israel comes not only to believe in the Lord, but to fear the Lord as well. And that word fear has to do with reverence. They start to have a healthy respect and understanding of who this God actually is. And I think that fear motivated what we find in verse 1, where they turned to him in praise. And we get the beautiful song of Moses, the deliverance of Israel, and the verses that follow. God set his people free to make them his, and they're coming to understand that the Lord is the only master worth serving. That's an invitation for us today as well. Very briefly, I want to make just a a brief pastoral observation with this text at this point, because we're talking about trust. And I recognize that there's a kind of personal dynamic that may be coming out for some of us, even in this room today, maybe even an objection this morning. You might be saying this, something like this in yourself. Kyle, I do believe God fights for me and that I should serve him and that he wants my well-being. Do you know the thing I'm going through? today? It doesn't seem like God is the business of fighting for me now. You've been trusting. but It doesn't seem like he's showing up in the ways you'd hoped he would. Well, the first thing I want to say is this. This passage absolutely does reveal a God who is mighty to save. Make no mistake. But it doesn't reveal how we should expect God to act in every and all situations, right? We may want him to part the waters for us, but this story doesn't promise that he will do so in every situation, right? And so that leaves us with still a question, right? Why do we experience hardship sometimes, even though God is mighty to save? We've all been there, right? And of course, we know on some level, it's a mystery known only to God in his wise and loving plan. He knows. We don't always know the reason. And so this could be the topic of a whole other sermon, but I just want to speak very briefly to that for a moment. What do we do in the midst of that? Here are just a couple quick thoughts for today. First, we can pray. We can still pray. We can seek out God and cry out to him like a psalm like Psalm 106, actually, where in that psalm, the psalmist asks God to act in power on Israel's behalf, just like God did at the Red Sea. He's done it before. Lord, will you do it again? In his mercy, God can and does sometimes answer these cries for help in the ways that we'd hoped, in the ways that we longed for. He can answer, so we should pray. A psalm like 106 is a great place to start. Second, even if he doesn't answer in the ways that we'd hoped. We can decide in our deep heart that the God who has fought for his people in the past, including you and me, is a God who can be trusted, even if our present circumstances cause us to doubt in some way. It's a decision of our will at times to remember and believe that God is trustworthy. Third, We can cling to the promise that in his power, he can and will accomplish all the good he has in mind for us. As Paul reminds us in Romans 8, where he says, and we know that for those who love God, what? All things work together for good. We can cling to that in the midst of our circumstances. And lastly, in the meantime, as we wait on the Lord, as we seek his help, as we ask for deliverance in whatever the area may be, we can receive growth in freedom. Those circumstances may actually be a time when God wants to grow in us the freedom that he has in mind for us. A freedom that can liberate our souls even as we endure difficult circumstances. 
And sometimes true freedom grows because of the circumstances that we're in, not in spite of them. The kind of freedom God wants for us can grow even in the midst of the difficult circumstances we face. There's a lot more we could say about that, but let me leave you with those thoughts for just a moment with respect to this passage. Here's the third and final point about freedom from this passage this morning. Simply this, God frees us through his chosen one. God frees us through his chosen one. In verse 31, we see that the crossing of the Red Sea not only instilled a a, a faith in the Lord, but also trust in his servant Moses as God's chosen leader. The Lord had worked through Moses. Now for Israel at the time of the Exodus, that trust looked like following Moses toward the promised land. And obviously, as I kind of alluded to before, there was grumbling along the way that trust ebbed and flowed, but that was the call to them in that moment. They had seen the Lord work through Moses and it instilled trust in him for the people. And for future generations after Moses, after Moses had died, there was a sense in which they still trusted in his leadership, but they did it through obeying the law of Moses, which included God's commands that were meant for their flourishing, the flourishing of the people of God. The law of Moses also held within it the sacrificial system because God knew that the people wouldn't live up to all the commands and they needed a way to be made right with him again. And so there was also a trust in the sacrificial system at the time. But the New Testament teaches that the freedom achieved through Moses was only ever partial. Several New Testament writers say that Jesus is the new and the better Moses. So in a place like Acts 13, Paul could show up in a Jewish synagogue and say these words with conviction. By Jesus, everyone who believes is freed from everything which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. There was still a freedom left on the table for God's people, and it was won through Jesus Christ. Paul tells the synagogue leaders that there's a more complete freedom that is found in Jesus, and it's available to them, to you, to me. Jesus won the freedom that the Red Sea could only foreshadow for us by dying on the cross for our sin. He didn't just represent and lead God's people like Moses did. He actually took our place. He took the place of God's people on the cross so that we could be set free once and for all from the power of sin. Thanks be to God. The truth that God fights for us finds its fullest expression in Jesus of Nazareth. Because for all of us as human beings, there is actually a central conflict around who we are. Who do we ultimately belong to? Do we belong to the power of sin and death or do we belong to the Lord? In Jesus, God, the God who created us, became one of us so that he could fight for us. That's the good news this morning. And on the cross, Jesus set us free forever from our slavery to sin and death. Because you see, in the character, the very nature of God is this truth. God wants to set us free. God wants to set us free. He wants to set us free to make us his. And he has chosen to free us through his chosen one, Jesus Christ. Why? Because he loves us and he wants to make us fully alive forever. Jesus fought for us on the cross. He proved his love for us there. He can be trusted. I hope that communicates you can trust him. To imagine him nailed on the cross for you. He is the only way to true freedom on this side of eternity and the next. And he calls each one of us to say yes to his offer of freedom. I hear it in places like Matthew 11, where Jesus says to his disciples, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, 
and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I hear Jesus' beautiful words as an invitation today to press deeper into the freedom that he has won for all of us. So let's ask ourselves, honestly before the Lord, will I follow Jesus further into the abundant life that only he can give? Lord, I pray this morning, earnestly in the power of the Spirit, that you would fill us once again with the wonder of what you've done for us. You have freed us to make us yours. And Lord, we know uh, that is an ongoing process. We are still becoming more and more fully yours each and every day. But Lord, I pray also for the conviction deep in our hearts to believe that that is the only way to receive true freedom in our lives. Lord, we turn to you. We need you. And God, I ask for any here who may feel a barrier or a roadblock in receiving that freedom, God, would you just minister to that place right now? If there, is, if there is any struggle or hardship that's being endured right now, Lord, I just ask that you would fill each person with uh, just a sense of your nearness and that you can be trusted, even in the midst of whatever difficult circumstance we face. Lord, I pray also that if there are any roadblocks that we've created for ourselves, Lord, we are turning to something else for freedom. Lord, that can't deliver on its promise. I just pray you'd help us to reject that now in Jesus' name. Would you help us to reject it, Lord, whatever that might be, and to turn once again to you. Thank you, Lord. Help each one of us to receive afresh today the great love you have for us. Make us yours, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.